you were literally like wholesalers became wholesalers. They bought it and they put it on market and they made a huge spread. Like, so deals really dried up and it was like, we have to spend money on marketing. And I remember being so scared, like, dude, I don't want to go and drop a bunch of money on marketing. Like, what if it doesn't work out? And then we got that deal. I was like, we just paid for marketing for 10 years. We're all good. Real Deals podcast listeners, this is show 380. Pretty hard to believe that I've made it to show 380 already. I think it started in the 340s. Um, pretty proud of myself in the sense of I'm a very big idea guy. I'm not always the best follow through guy. And I have only missed one show one week. We had some issues and both issues with those shows were technical issues where the recording got lost on a Google on a drive that I had downloaded it on. So pretty proud of myself. You know, if you're the idea, the, you know, inventor type of person, you're not the executor of the business, you would definitely understand and appreciate like you get really excited about these ideas and you're all in, all in and all in. And then you find out that there's actually work involved and it's not as fun anymore because it's not new and exciting. And so pretty cool that I've uh, made it to show 380 and Tucker has not taken me back off the mic yet. So this week, really cool show and it's a full circle show. Um, I have two guys, Noah Evans and Jeff Fawson. They are from Boise, Idaho. And I'll get into the full circle part here in a second. They are running a, a wholesale fix and flip rental and now development business out in Boise. They are crushing, crushing, crushing. The crazy thing is they just partnered up nine, 10 months ago. They were both really good at something when they got together and they're like, Hey, why don't we work together? Jeff is a really good operator. He's built some houses, done remodels, done a lot of construction and he's good at managing projects. Noah's a really good idea guy, and he is a good sales guy, and so he is really good at building out the marketing and sales teams and things like that, more of the inventor, you know, idea guy, kind of like I am. So Noah and I have hit it off really well, and Jeff is an amazing guy as well. We talk a little bit about Jeff's story, and these are things I didn't know, and this is why I love my show, is I ask questions that most people won't ask, and I try to dive into some of these things. There's a perception out there in this world that in order to be successful, you have to be born with some opportunity or somebody coaching you or have, you know, different things that a lot of people don't have in order to be successful. Jeff takes that and kicks it in the teeth and totally proves that point wrong. Jeff grew up without a father around, his dad serving life in prison. He grew up in Portland, Oregon. He jumped around from house to house, trailer to trailer, uh, was homeless for parts of his life, and was able to make it out of that world, and now is probably on his way, if he's not already there, to having a million net worth at 27 years old. And so he was a good student. He was kind of protected by his brothers and sisters, but he was able to get out of that world and find a way to be successful. So really cool hearing more about that from his story. And Noah, where it comes in full circle, Noah had called me about three years ago. He was driving, um, he was living in Yakima, Washington at the time, which is about an hour away from our house where I live. And he had heard me on a, one of the podcasts, either, either Bigger Pockets or The Real Deals. And when he listened to me, he's like, man, this guy's really close to me. If he can do it, I can do it. So he Googled my number, found me, gave me a call. And I was kind of rude to him. Probably at the time, I was probably busy golfing. And I said, go listen to the first 50. I always tell people the first 50, he said 80, but usually the first 50 episodes of the Real Deals podcast. I think Tucker is extremely smart, but I think the first 50 episodes are a roadmap on how to build a business. And I still give that advice today because that's what I did. I listened to him multiple times. And he's like, and then I'm like, call me back after you do this. Well, nobody ever calls me back when I tell him that, but he did a week later. And then he got a deal. I helped him kind of through this deal down the road. Didn't really hear much from him after that point. And he was moving around because his wife's in medical school, just became a doctor, and now she's in res residency. So they land in Boise, and I have a client in the call center that wanted to buy a bunch of houses in Boise. And so i still friends with Noah on Facebook, so I reached out to him, and they we started talking and became friends. Well, we really dive into their story of how their partnership has really taken off and how well they're doing and all these different things they're doing from buying rentals in, in Indiana and building a team out there to doing, you know, three to eight lot subdivisions that they're breaking off land off of a house, doing fix and flips, all these different things that they're doing. And it's just really, really cool how much they're growing. So 
I think this is a great show. It's not as long as normally um, we go into, but we get into a lot of details and a lot of nuggets of what they're doing in their business. And they're doing some pretty cool marketing things. Uh, they're running a TV ad and it's actually working really well. So make sure you hear, listen about that. So what's going on with us this week? So not a ton new. We did lock up uh, two deals though this week. So that's kind of exciting. I haven't locked up a deal for a little while. I've uh, been traveling too much and we've been building out our systems. We switched from Podio to Forefront CRM. And so we've been, you know, trying to build Podio out. We just couldn't get it to work right for us. So we just went to Forefront and seems like it's going to work really well. But so the first deal that we tied up it is an older house in in my home city of Richland. Um, and we tied it up for a good price. It's a huge fix. So we're probably going to look at either picking up, t t taking it down and cleaning it up a little bit and wholetailing it and giving the, the retail in or investors what they want or we're gonna to try to wholesale it out most likely. So that could be a pretty good deal, I think. And then my Tony and my partner, Corey, tied up a deal yesterday in Vancouver. We are just gonna get paid out from him on that. He, we're gonna pay Tony a, a, a fee for acquisitions fee, and then we're gonna get a small wholesale fee because it's gonna be more of like a buy and hold, it's something I just didn't wanna be a part of and didn't wanna put my money into. So. Just take a little bit of, of a fee there and that should close in a couple of weeks. So really good. My wife was telling me I needed to get more deals in the pipeline. So really good. When she told me that last week, we get two locked up this week. So now I look like a hero to my wife. So also looking at some other uh, opportunities this week, we looked at uh, a property that has is already a multifamily property, has some land attached to it that we can build more density. So we met with the owner yesterday and went through a lot of different scenarios with him. So you, you always got to be open to new ideas. It's not always, hey, I'll pay you cash and we buy it there, especially when you have these retired or these landlords that probably want to retire. They have money. They don't want to pay capital gains taxes. There's ways to structure these deals. Can you structure a partnership? Can you structure an uh, uh, option agreement? Can you st structure a uh, owner carry back. The, the one idea though that I've been going into these owner carry conversations with, with sellers is I'm always looking out for what their best interest is. They are talking less now about uh, the capital gains tax, but they were talking really heavily this year on uh, raising the capital gains tax to like 40%. And so that is a huge difference. So when I'm talking about these owner carries where we're doing them to structure out and draw out capital gains tax over a few years, that you have to be willing if they're gonna implement and change that law, and if that law says, hey, it's any capital gains tax you've received or capital, you know, taxable capital gain income, not something that's, you know, from grandfathered in, and they would have to pay a higher capital gains tax on that, you have to have a contingency in there and be ready to buy out that property before that happens. So you want to look out for your sellers in that example, where is all of a sudden, hey, you say they're paying a 25% cap gains tax, then Biden comes in at a 40%, it takes into effect in 2022. Well, Mr. Seller, we got to close on it in 2021, because that you're going to pay 15% more, maybe we can structure a little bit better payoff earlier payoff deal in there, if we do have to pay it off early, but you have to be willing and available to have the funds available to go do those things. So make sure you're thinking about that for the sellers. And if you tell the sellers that it immediately gives you such a authority and a good rapport because they're like, Oh, look, this guy's thinking about me and my financial situation and actually looking out what's best for me, not what's just best for him. So I think that's a really good tool to use in your tool belt right now with the things that are going on in the, in the government. I don't want to dive too deep into it, but what they're talking about with the cap gains and, and taxes and all those things. So without further ado, let's get into this week's show. I think you're really, really going to like it. Here's a quick word from our sponsor, Iron Bridge. Then we will catch you guys next week. Have a great weekend. What's going on, Real Deals Podcast listeners? We are starting out show 380, and that is... Like, I think I'm in like 45 episodes. And so guys, pretty excited to have you on the show. I got Jeff Fawson and Noah Evans from Boise, Nampa, Idaho. They are crushing it out there. They are got fix and flips. They got wholesale deals. They got development deals. They got rentals that got going. They got tons of stuff. And I don't even think that either one of them has had to shave yet. So that's pretty exciting. Why don't we guys jump in a little bit, talk about who you are, how you guys met up. And we'll start with you, Jeff. 
Yeah, for sure. So uh, I actually got started real estate investing in Portland about seven years ago and kind of just did fix and flips on my own one at a time. Didn't make much money doing it though. It didn't turn out too well. I was the guy swinging the hammer, laying the floors, doing all that fun stuff. So I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. I wasn't very good at it. So I started looking at how I could partner up with people and grow my business. Eventually wound up in Boise, Idaho. I had some failed partnerships that didn't work out because of uh, bad expectations on what what each partner was supposed to do on the front end. Both of us wanted to be like CEO, not on the job site, not doing stuff, not running projects. So those didn't work out. Uh, I linked up with Noah and the business just kind of blew up. It was like rocket fuel. And we went from doing like two or three flips at a time. So we got nine projects normally running about at a time, as well as some infill development stuff that we're doing. Uh, we started building a rental portfolio in Indiana this year. So we're just kind of trying to take our revenue from here in Boise, roll it over into smaller markets in the Midwest for long-term cash flow and build long-term wealth. So that's what we're doing now. That's how we got started. And yeah, that's where we're at. And how old are you? Uh, 27 years old. And I did shave this morning, but there wasn't a lot of hair to shave. So, so. yeah. And uh, <laughs> did you go to college or anything? Yeah, I went to uh, just like, I was like that on or off guy. Actually, in hindsight, I guess it's good I dropped out. I had a full ride scholarship, so I went, but I didn't like, I wasn't passionate about like what I wanted to do. I want to be like a high school history teacher with like looking back at it now, like that was just kind of like the cop out. Like everybody wants to be a teacher because you grow up in school. So it seems natural and it seems easy. But yeah, I wasn't in it for the long haul. I dropped out after my freshman year. Nice. Did you get a scholarship for figure skating or what? What was it? <laughs> no, actually, uh, I just, I, I grew up a real ghetto kid. So I wrote like a really compelling letter about like, why I was so poor and why my life sucked. And that, like, I just really wrote this really good story about how shitty my life was. And because of that, they're like, wow, you have a horrible life and a 3.8 GPA. That's good enough to get a full ride scholarship. So awesome. Yeah, pretty, that's how I got it. <laughs> but it was, was it a shitty life. Yeah. I mean, I like, I mean, I don't want to get too deep, but my dad's in serving life in prison and we grew up super poor. So, you know, been around the block a couple of times, but homeless a couple of times, but we made it out. We're all right. Doing better now, creating wealth for the long-term family. So. We're going to dive back into that. So, yeah, Noah, wh what about you? What's up, man? First off, thanks for having us on the show. Yeah, for sure. Uh, appreciate uh, you bringing us on. Um, so you guys will get a kick out of how I got started. So I finished up school at Southern Utah University, graduated with my marketing degree. It didn't do anything for me, um, and I was very unhappy at my corporate job. So I thought, how do I get out of this race, this rat race? I just wanted more for myself. I wanted more for my family. And uh, most of all, I didn't want someone else controlling my day um, or who I choose to spend it with or how. Every year that my corporate job would tell me I could only take two weeks off and I was gone for four weeks every December, the entire month. They never fired me. So <laughs> anyways, when I moved out to Yakima, Washington, um, I started listening to real estate podcast. Somehow I came across Elliot. I think it was either Bigger Pockets or it might have been this show. And so I was like, OK, this guy, it, it made it very real for me because you were so close so I was like, okay, if he could do it and he's like an hour and a half away, then obviously this works. Like this is real and this, it works in this market. And if this and dumbass like, that I just listened on this show can do it, you know, <laughs> then I can definitely that's do it because I'm not quite like, well, He made it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I like Googled you and like found your number somehow and called you. And uh, we've talked about this story a lot, but I think it'd be really funny for the listeners to hear. So I, I, I called Elliot up. I was like, hey man, I, I want to get started in wholesaling. I don't know. Um, what to do? Would you, can you point me in the, in the right direction? And it, it may not have been word for word, but it was pretty dang close where you were like, dude, don't effing call me again until you've listened to the first like 80 episodes of Tucker Mary, Hughes podcast. That's so funny. It may not, it may not be word for word, but it's pretty dang close. But see, I, that didn't hurt my feelings. Like I knew like you were a person of value and your time was worth more than my time was. And that you just wanted me to take action. So I think I called you back like the next week and I was like, okay, I did it and I need X, Y, and Z. And I, you, you gave me my first purchase and sales agreement. You walked me through how the title process worked and it, it, you almost didn't believe me at first. I was like, no, I'm serious. Like I listened to all 80. It was like Ellensburg. Weren't you doing something in Ellensburg? Uh, my partner, my first partner was in Ellensburg. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, now that that contract actually helped me close my first deal, it took like another six months after that to go get something. But um, so that was my first bite of real estate. So it's, it's just kind of cool that you were a part of the beginning journey yeah. And now here we are like four years, three or four years later. Um, and a lot has changed. So yeah, it's, it's um, funny. And you know, I tell people all the time, people ask me for help and I tell them, go do this. And it's probably more simple what I tell them to do now than that. Listen to those 80 shows. Yeah. And, they, and I'm like, I'll give you a free hour. If you call, if you do these things for the next two months and then call me back and nobody ever, ever does. And it's just like, yeah. that you're a proof that if you just listen to something that somebody has to say and go take some action, then they want to help you. 
Yep. Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. And honestly, that tough love was actually more so what I needed because, like, had you just given, have you been like, okay, you're gonna need a purchase and sales agreement and this and this and this, you probably would have given it to me. And the ch- what are the chances that I would have done something with it versus having to go earn the knowledge? Yeah. Myself. Yeah. You know what yep. I mean? So yeah. So I landed that first wholesale. After that, I was like, man, I can really scale this up. But I was still kind of scared. So I joined on with a mentor. I gave away 70% of the deal for like the next year. We did a handful of wholesales. Yeah. I, I probably never told you that. <laughs> yep. He's like, you didn't hear that on the podcast. <laughs> I didn't get no percentage of that first deal. I feel robbed. <laughs> <laughs> that first one was funny too, man. I talk about it uh, a couple. I, I think I talked about it in my last podcast, but um, I actually didn't. I, I, I did. I know I knew so little. I erased my name on the purchase and sales agreement and put the new buyer. Huh. So he literally, th- there's no record of that. He needed to pay me for anything. And, um, luckily he was an honest guy and he gave me my, my, my assignment, my $10,000 check, but he did not have to, there was no legal, there was nothing legal backing that up. So how do you get to Boise? Uh, my wife's in uh, medical school. So she's been kind of dragging us all around the country. So when we moved here, I was like, that's it. I'm going all in. So I took the money I'd saved up from wholesaling. I bought a house turned it into a duplex. Cause I was like, I need to, I need the financial security to feel good about going into real estate full time. And in that process, I was interviewing contractors. So I met Jeff and his brother, they agreed to take on the job. Um, and then through doing that, Jeff and I just formed a relationship. And then Jeff came to me with a project almost that same month. Yep. And he's like, this is a funny story. Actually. He's like, Hey, if you bring like 20 grand to this flip, we can do something on it. So we structured out, our, we structured out a partnership. I didn't have 20 grand, by the way, I just blew all my money on the, on the rehab to the basement. But I told him I did. I had $5,000 left. That was it. And I had no money to pay my mortgage payment. So I gave him the full five. I went to my friends and family. I got five from my cousin, who turns out he also didn't have the money. He used the money. He, he pulled out student loan, uh, a go. student loan. <laughs> and then uh, I went to one of my other buddies. And I was like, hey, man, I know you do pretty well in solar. Would you mind lending me some money for, you know, three to six months? He gave me the other 10. Nice. So that's how Jeff and I did our first deal. And after that, we like, I locked up like another one and then he, we figured out the financing on it. And then before we knew it, we had like three going on at once. And I was like, this is crazy. I didn't even know I could flip a house. How long you guys been doing, doing it? We partnered up uh, right about midway through quarter three of last year. So just almost to a year of doing it together. Nice. Awesome. So not super long, but you guys are rolling right along. Seemed like you guys are figuring it out quite a bit. So I'm going to go back to Jeff for a minute because one of the things that I think, you know, is the misnomer of people thinking that you got to be a certain certain type of person and like nobody can, you know, not everybody can do this. Like, yeah, I, you know, we talk about opportunity. Like my dad talked to me about real estate growing up and things like that. And I just had more knowledge than most people, but you didn't. Jeff, you had you yeah. know a dad in prison. You grew up you know, homeless. You're trying to figure out how to just live and not get shot, probably, and yeah. you know not get. <laughs> not get him. But yeah, I mean, but you're just trying to figure out how to live and probably trying to eat yeah. and like what what you know, you know how do I look halfway decent at school, right? So yeah. yep. what what got you going in this direction? Like, because you started seven years ago, so when you're 20, basically. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like growing up, I was always like the like, I don't want to offend my siblings, but like, I was always the one that like the community would try and protect, right? Like, Oh, Jeff has good grades. Oh, Jeff's good at sports. Like, let's try and shelter Jeff from what's going on. And like, I wasn't blind to it. Like I knew like, Hey, people are really looking out for me. And so like my response to that was like, I need to be their provider then. Like if they're going to sacrifice things and then like try and make sure that I have at least this little, this little path that I can kind of be protected on and follow, then it's going to be my responsibility to to provide for him. So I started looking at like little side hustles, like being a young kid, man, like I would buy like candy bars from there. We had a little grocery grocery outlet. You could buy like three candy bars for a dollar. And I would go and I would fib a little and say it was for Boy Scouts. But I'll go and knock on doors and say, hey, I'm selling candy bars for a dollar fifty for Boy Scouts. <laughs> so I just started making money that way. Like literally my mom worked so much. Like that's how we would buy our dinner sometimes. Like we'd go down to Taco Bell and we'd spend the six bucks on on our little beefy five layer burritos that at the time were 89 cents, but inflation has killed that. They're now yeah. like two bucks. But uh so I was I always had that spirit about me. But like so when I, I actually got fortunate though, like I'll I'll never lie, like I had like I had that drive in me, but then like I had opportunity come knocking and I just made sure I was going to capitalize on it. So I got engaged to my wife at the time. We got engaged when we were 19 and I started uh, working her, 
her like practically her second dad owned a bunch of businesses. He owned like a lighting company, a roofing company, asbestos abatement company, just did all sorts of stuff in Portland. Um, and then flipped houses like every once in a while. So he hired me and he literally called me like his puppy. Like that was what was on my job paperwork was like I was the puppy and I was just to do like whatever they told me to do. Like literally the first week of working there, I crumpled up papers and threw them into a burn barrel. Like I ended up having to go to the doctors because I got carpal tunnel because I just sat there for 40 hours <laughs> crumpling the paper and throwing it in. But uh, I quickly realized like, man, this dude, like I just noticed like, hey, he takes time off when he wants. Like he has some freedom that like, like I don't want to live a life of like just barely getting by and like. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, I still got like, my mom works two jobs, like, my brother's just down in Southern California in a, in a rough spot, like my sister's down there, like somehow I got to figure out a way to like, build a, a lifeline for these people, throw them something and bring them up with me. So I got really attracted to real estate and just happened to be a seminar blew through town. And I was like, dude, I can do that. There's no reason I cannot do that. And so I just actually went and like, I started studying like the path of progress in Portland and found like a neighborhood that was still pretty ghetto at the time, but that it was starting to gentrify and things were pushing out. So I started knocking on doors and I got my first deal that way and went back to this guy and said, Hey, look, I'm going to quit. I, I can't work for your company anymore, but I know you really love real estate and I'd be, it would be awesome if we partnered on this. And so like, that's how it worked out. Like I was a hustler and a grinder, but I also had the opportunity of having this guy in my life who, if he wasn't in my life, I don't know if they, it would have worked out the way it did. So yeah, but I'm a firm believer. Like I'm nothing special. Like I'm, I'm not that intelligent. Um, but I'm, but I'm, I'm special because I, like I, I, I follow what other people yeah. say. Right. Like I'm not highly intelligent. Like I can speak okay when I really want to, but like, other than that, like I just take action and have consistency and do what people who are smarter than me tell me to do. And like, that's what real, real estate for me really boils down to is like, find a mentor and, and follow their advice. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. That's right. Yeah, I just had these guys and I say, go do this. And I'm like, okay. You know, I tell a story all the time. You know, the first, I met Tarl Yarber on Bigger Pockets, and yeah. he's, he had posted, hey, I'm, I'm going to start buying houses in Portland. I need somebody to go run properties for me every now and then. And so I talked to him, I'll, I'll do it. And this is when I was working for friends. And he's like, hey, I need to go take some photos of this property. It's like 800 square foot property in Southeast. And he's like, just make sure you get everything. I, I remember sending him a Dropbox link with 450 photos because I didn't want to miss anything. I just went above <laughs> and beyond, right? Because like yeah. 800 square foot house, I mean, I had so many photos. In there. <laughs> he was but, like, bro, I didn't mean that many. Yeah, and so then he told me something else to go do. And then I had other mentors go do this. And I'm like, I'm just dumb enough to just listen to you and not overthink yeah. it, right? And so, yeah, it's, it's, and same with you, Noah. You were just dumb enough to just say, okay, if this guy says I should go do it, he looks like he knows what he's doing. I'm going to go do it. Yeah. Right? And so now we find, now you hire a coach and you find somebody the next level up and the next level this be smarter than me and tell me what, what I don't know. Yep. So, all right. Awesome, dude. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit of that, that, that I appreciate you sharing that. So yeah, for sure. All right. So you guys now are in Boise and you guys got a bunch of stuff going on. Why don't you guys talk a little bit about what you got going on and then we'll dive into it a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we're primarily the like fix and flippers they're, they're, we have somebody in our market who says it way smarter than that she calls herself residential resi redeveloper residential redeveloper that's so the I, fancy term i put that on my business card actually <laughs> did um, you yeah, it sounds better yeah than saying good. a flipper like i'm a flipper of what you have a you have a mermaid tail i don't know so yeah residential <laughs> redeveloper we are we are pretty consistently keeping about nine active projects going at any one time and then uh we we really want that that lifestyle piece of it the freedom that comes from it and flipping is awesome like we love flipping yeah but flipping is like a ferrari wealth vehicle right you can go really fast but you cannot go that far mm. so um we're taking the money and actually redeploying it into buy and hold rentals um because that to me is what ultimately is going to create that freedom so like my goal is that like by 30 if we really wanted to we can completely never work another day in our life and our families will be fine. Now we're not going to we both love, we both actually love, you know, the industry and working yeah. hard, but we started in just this perspective for people who are wanting to get started too. We didn't, other than my duplex that I own, that I owned before our partnership, we didn't buy our first rental till January of this year. Yep. And we are at, um, at the end of this week, if these closings go through successfully, we'll be at 15 doors. Um, we have another 10 here in Boise, uh, in Nampa, Idaho, that we're trying to burr. We should find the financing for it, but we're already rehabbing it, adding value and putting yep. better tenants in place. And then we have another duplex, um, Veterans Park, which is like this cool little trendy area of Boise. So all in, like we should be almost at, I mean, we'll be over 30 units by the end of the year, hopefully closer to 50. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Okay. But I want to dive in a little bit because we might have some differences of how you get there. 
So yeah. you guys are buying and we'll come back to some other stuff, but you guys are yeah. buying rentals in Indiana. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that will go do this. So they're too expensive. Money's properties are too expensive in the market. They don't think they can cash flow. So they go to these other markets that are cash flow, but they're not really appreciating markets, right? Correct. Correct. Yep. yep. And so you tend to have harder, there's other challenges, right? Just with everything, there's challenges, you know, rehabs versus new construction, there's different challenges and, and ease it. Some things are easier. Yeah. Why Indiana? Yeah. Why, why there? And why don't you stay in Boise and build your footprint in Boise? Yeah. So we're building, we are building Boise as well, but it's not our main focus. We only build Boise if the burst strategy works well, just because the market has increased so much that the cap rates, people are buying it like they're buying duplexes on cap rates out here and they're buying them at like four and a quarter cap. So like the cash flow is just non-existent and we just don't have at the time being, we don't have the, the lender with the cheap enough money to make those work for us. But we're working on developing those and then and trying to set those up. But Indiana, we just, it was, we realized we had a strategic advantage there. So we were identifying some markets that we wanted to go into. A deal came along. And so we just started reaching out to people in those markets, some property managers, some lenders, stuff like that. And in Indiana, the package of properties we were looking at at the time, they cash flowed great. And then everything just kind of lined up that we were wanting to line up. We got a, a realtor that was excited to work with us. We got a property manager who could run, not only just like be the property manager, but she'll run like fix and flips for us. So if we need to burr over there, she was ready to do the burrs. She has two of her own crew and like she just kind of offers this full service program um, as well as the lending and then getting everything set up over there just kind of it just lined up really well whereas like the other markets that we're looking at like some of the deals penciled but when we were calling property managers we didn't have anybody that was excited to work with us or had a great program so we stuck with indiana because we just built that team successfully over there and decided to run with that that team that we had set up pretty easily i think with remote markets it's extremely important to have to go where you have a competitive advantage yep and our property manager and our team there was our competitive advantage. Yep. So. Yeah. The one thing I'm going to challenge you on though, because you guys have built a business where you've found, done a really good job at finding deals with equity, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll give you a quick example. We bought a duplex because duplexes in Vancouver don't really cash flow. Same, same idea. Vancouver, Portland, very similar in yeah. certain yep. aspects. Yeah. But we we bought a duplex over there that needed a ton of work, bought it for 200, put like 70 in it. Let's say we're all in at 280, appraised it. 395 we pull all our cash back out um we got private lenders to lend majority of everything and we're cash flowing 1200 bucks a month but we also have a 100k you know 100 let's say 115k equity gain right probably yeah. more now mm-hmm. right so you know if you're good at finding deals in boise and creating that equity spread you can still get some cash flow right and your equity gain on paper yeah. which you can borrow against later is going to be yep. so much bigger than your cash flow. So I think there's such a balance between like, cause we're doing this not out of mark, out of state, but it's such a balance between cash flow, cash now and cash later. Right. And true wealth. Yeah. Right. And so if you look at the life of Midwest now, I think they're still appreciating now a little bit, but if you look at life, you can still buy houses for 30 or $40,000. Right. Yeah. Yep. yep. When was the last time you could buy a house for thirty thousand dollars in Boise? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, probably actually, not five, too long ago. Years we, ago no, probably. probably like did. <laughs> but we we are we are still buying here if the deal makes sense. So we have we have a duplex that we're uh, refinancing. We got that ten unit that we're gonna figure out how to refinance that. We got a duplex on owner carry. Yeah, but it's the owner carry, but we already yeah. have the lender set up to do that. We have so we have a lender in our local market for fours and unders. So we're actually. We are now partnering with the arbitrage company too to Airbnb some of our stuff in trendier neighborhoods. So we have a uh, two house set up on one acre in Meridian that we're holding on to for future development potential. But we're going to refinance that, arbitrage that out, keep that on Airbnb. The duplex in Boise will do the same. And then we have a, uh, a house with the ADU on the bench that we're going to refinance and keep here as well. Because yeah, like the appreciation gain here is it'd be stupid. If you can get a little bit of cash flow, like our cash flow here doesn't need to be anything near where it is in the Midwest, because we know we have the upside of the appreciation. So if it makes sense, we're still doing it. It's just not our primary focus. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's jump into partnerships. So you guys are not even a year into your partnership. I partner with a lot of people. Partnerships are really hard. You know, Tucker, if you listen, people listen to Tucker over the years, he doesn't do partnerships. Well, he's partnered with me now, but on the real estate side, he doesn't do partnerships, right? Yep. So because it's very difficult to match, find something that matches your energy or your give a shit level, right? Yeah. And if you do, sometimes that partner tends to be similar to you. And so if you have two partners that are the same, 
the two head, you know, you only need one of those. You don't need the two of the same yeah. guys. So how do you guys, yeah. how have you guys structured a responsibilities? How have you guys found that, like ways to work well together? How have you integrated that? Yeah, I would say that it's, it's a day by day thing for the, mo you know what I mean? Like, it's not that it's always easy, but I think we complement each other really well. So, and then I, I, on top of that, I would also say that like, we both just have like the same long-term goal. Like we want to build a massive business that impacts people in a positive way that, that the community benefits from the things that we're doing. And, you know, we want to live a life of being able to have like freedom and give other people freedom too. So the common end goal, I think is what aligns us and allows us to, to work together well. And then as far as like skills and stuff like that, or like, uh, like roles and responsibilities, I would say we definitely have a long way to go in assigning that properly. Yeah. We've what, done what is your current, what does it currently look like? So I oversee like the, the project management, the operations. There, there is some bleed over that we both have right now, but it's just because we started to scale and we're like, okay, let's now. And this is where like, this is one of the reasons I believe in our partnership is we don't just say, hey, what do you think and what do I think? We come to guys like you and we say, hey, Elliot, look at our strength finder test and tell us who would be better at this role. Or we go to our mentors in Ohio and say, hey, you give us the feedback. And we're like, again, we're just dumb guys who want to be successful. So we'll follow what you say. Yep. So like, Right now we're, we're, we're redefining some of those roles, but I oversee like the operations, construction, budgets, uh, communicating with our main mortgage lender and making sure they have all the documents to line up the projects, get our, our scope of works done, and then get our money coming in on the, cause our rehab loans are like traditional rehab loans from a hard money lender. So we're recouping those throughout the course of the project. So, you're so I stay on top of this. Yeah, I'm yeah. like operations and then Noah handles, um, we both like confirm marketing, but Noah definitely oversees our marketing channel more. And then we had both been splitting sales, but now it's to the point that the company's growing and we're bringing in follow-up specialists and acquisitions. So Noah's taking on the role of training those guys. So. Seems yeah, like you guys got separated pretty well. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's a new thing as like we've, scaled so right. quickly that we were like like two months ago we would have been freaking deer in the headlights if you asked us that question like i don't know jeff is just good at what he does and Noah's good at what he does but could we tell you what that is but now that we're scaling and we're starting to like put in processes and procedures mm -hmm. and bring in like like we grew from a company of two guys so like we're about to have six or seven people in-house on the investment side within the next month so like now it's like it can't just be no and jeff like this is an actual yeah. company. You define your roles, you build your processes and procedures and make sure people are in place to do what they're supposed to do. And we're just being smart about who oversees those people based on their skill sets. Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. How do you guys, um, who likes to work more? I would say we both do. The one thing I would say is Noah's much more of like a studier. Like I'm a very like, if, if there's something like I'm on my laptop every night before going to bed, like responding to emails, staying up on like the day to day stuff and like Noah's much more of a visionary, but it's never just like he's dreaming in the clouds. Like he's always thinking, OK, I know we have 200K coming in from these flips this month. That means that we can roll that and partner up with these specific guys and go and do this out of state or do this in our local market. So. That, and I think that's one of the great things about our partnership is we both love, like, we get so excited about this industry. Like, we call each other at 10 o'clock at night, and my wife's like, what the heck are you doing? I'm like, bro, we're talking about a deal. It just is what it is. Like, <laughs> we both love working and making money and, and trying to grind this out in this next three to five years while we build this this wealth vehicle. And I, if I if I get granular, I think, on, like, what, like, the whole rocket fuel, rocket fuel part of our partnership has been, it's been that, you know, I get to plug and play into the flip business, but still but still go out and come up with all these new marketing ideas of how we're going to reach people, yep. how creative we can be on finding money, how to creatively structure deals. Whereas if I didn't have Jeff as a partner, my energy and my decision-making capacity would be spent on running projects, yep. not running the business. So, or coming up with new ideas for our business. So yep. who, who um, reigns you guys in? Who reigns, who, who reigns you in from spending, overspending too many crazy ideas, too many different directions? Who, I, I'm pretty open. I mean, you know, Jeff does a Jeff does an awesome job of being like, hey, I think we should slow down. I think we should wait. I think we should tr see how this bootstraps, right? Being like, okay, before we go drop another five can of new marketing channel, let's wait and see what our KPI comes back on the cold calling we started or this mail campaign that we did. I, I would say Jeff does a, a good job of doing that. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the Rainer. I like to stay laser focused. Like we are a fix and flip company who redeploy money into long-term rentals. It's that simple. And infill, but that's just if it's a part of a flip. So, like, yeah. I stay very laser focused on that. And if it doesn't fit that bucket, then we're not doing it. Yeah, that's so. like we I, we kind of made Chrissy the CEO this year of our our fix and flip business and our just our business in general with all the rentals and the development and stuff like that. And we, we basically yeah. call her the leash. And it's not a bad thing. It's not a negative condemnation, but she has to pull me back on my leash sometimes and say, whoa, 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 what, what the hell are you doing? 
Like yeah. Elliot, look how much money you spent on this podcast room or this type of marketing or this, this thing and this thing. And, and like, are you monetizing it? Like, or are you yeah. just sitting there lighting money on fire? Cause you're doing yeah. <laughs> 10 different things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would say though, that there's sometimes a benefit to charging ahead and not knowing exactly what you're getting into. And I would say that that benefit is you learn as you go. Our, one of our mentors, her like full mentality is she's ready, fire, aim. And she has blown her business out, like out of the water. Like yeah. they did $500,000 in profit last month. They're on track to do 5 million this year. Now th I agree though, there needs to be somebody that's like, okay, Hey, you're fine to charge ahead, but are we looking at all the angles? Are we making sure that it has a, an ROI on what you're doing? Yeah. And I really think the idea behind it is I want to be here for the long term. Yeah. And everybody has, everybody looks really good until they get punched in the face. Yeah. Right? Everybody yeah. looks really good until this market shifts or something happens. Um, we got lucky last year with COVID that it kind of ran right through. Everybody looks like a yep. genius. I mean, we have one deal that we bought that we probably should have weren't gonna, weren't gonna do that good on. We overpaid for it a little bit and the market just bailed us out. We're gonna make 60, right? And yeah. so, you know, different market cycle, different time, you know, yep. we're looking a lot dumber in that situation. Same with all these development, yep. all these things. And so I think it's really easy in this market for J Noah guys like you and I to just push, 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 push. Cause we're so positive, right? We're so mm -hmm. glass is half full. No, the glass is overfilling with all these opportunities. I'm a push, push, push. And if you don't have somebody to say, whoa, let's make sure we build a solid foundation and make sure we're not just blowing money. Then, then I think you're here for the long term, Right. And that's, yeah. that's going to be an important thought. Yeah. And what's funny about it though, is like, like I would totally agree. Like I'm definitely the leash guy, but I would also say that we both agree that I'm probably the bigger risk taker on a per deal basis. Yeah. On a per like deal I basis, will, yeah. it, because if like, I just understand fit, like all I know is fix and flip real estate. And then like, now I'm starting to figure out the, the rental type stuff. Like fix and flips don't scare me. Like we just bought a house that didn't even have a floor. Like you walk in the front door and you drop in the basement and I'm not scared at all. Like I have this, I'm just not risk averse in that area. Whereas like, no one's like, Whoa, what, what the heck are we doing? But I like, I, it's, it's a good so, balance. Yeah. It's a great balance yeah. to have, but then it's very interesting that then he's not the leash guy and I'm the leash guy. And I'm just like, Nope, we stay focused here. We'll take massive risk here, but this is kind of the path that we stay focused on. Yeah. That's the devil, you know, right. And the end of the day, you know, this, you know, your yeah. numbers, if, and that's the thing when you start getting a multifamily is or development or things that what I found out is I don't know the numbers that well. So I get really nervous and I'm a lot more conservative. The more yeah, I yeah. know, like yeah. on fix and flips and things like this, if I can nail my numbers to, you know, to a T, I can be more confident paying more, but you have, when you don't know what the hell you're doing, you build in a buffer and then you don't get the deal. And you're like, you see this deal done three, you know, three years later, or two years later. And you're like, shit, I should have bought that deal. Those guys crushed yeah. it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's sometimes where we're building out like a spreadsheet on like some of these infill projects and it's like it literally just says like buffer with question marks. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know what I'm doing. Hundred K buffer. And it's like in an infill, luckily, if it's like a six to eight lot infill, like a hundred K is a good buffer to have. But like if you're talking about a two or three unit infill, like the hundred K could be the difference of whether or not you took that deal down or not. Mm -hmm. And so like you gotta really know you gotta really know those numbers and know where you're at, or bring in somebody who does. So, so. That's kind of well, our yeah, the problem right now with, with those is construction costs are throw con yeah. construction costs and timelines are really throwing a wrench in that, in that deal. Yep. Yeah. 100%. We're just looking to do the land development piece and get out and let the builder scratch their heads with the headaches, man. They got better systems on that side than we do. So. Yeah. And they have more, usually the bigger builders have more projects that can spread their risk around. They make yeah, smaller they margins. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So what have you guys found like the best, um, and this isn't in any way meant to plug for me in, in no way at all, but like you guys are using us for marketing, for cold calling, yeah. um, using our data, but what have you guys found? I know you're doing a radio ad or TV ad you're doing, I think you did some direct mail, cold, you know, cold calling, probably yourself a little bit. What, what have you guys found that's working really good for you right now? Yeah. I, you know, the, the, obviously the cold calling is phenomenal because one, it takes a lot off of our plate for yeah. acquisitions. We get a hot lead, a hot lead comes in, we talk to them. It's either a yes now or a maybe later or mm -hmm. a no. Yeah. This is just one of three buckets, right? So yeah. simplifying that side of it has definitely helped us to scale up. But I would say like becoming like a local market authority. Yeah. And I, I would say that we've, we've primarily done that through giving value to other people. 
Like I'll let agents double end deals. If they bring me something off market, they can take the full 6% commission. I could, I could care less. I would rather them succeed and bring me a deal and then we can close it and everybody wins. So for example, I got, I got three leads yesterday from agents all off market, all distressed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just, I mean, that's just a year of grinding it out and helping other people teach, whether it be teaching them how to analyze a property and see what it's going to be worth as a flip or, you know, letting people double in the deals or cutting people in on something, but becoming a market authority is definitely yeah. the primary, primary, um, lead source. At the yeah. Moment. I would say that's our primary, like organic lead source. And then like, as far as like an actual marketing channel, like driving for dollars has the best bang for bucks so far for us like money spent to leads in. Uh, we had one month where we literally got like three driving for dollars deals and they were all 60K flips. And it was like our second month to using the deal machine app. So we've had we've had really successful re results with the driving for mm -hmm. dollars. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the cold calls and TV commercial, like just last month, like they were doing okay. And then like last month, they just like all of a sudden we're like, we have literally like six deals under contract right now with like four to six more that like we're negotiating over pennies. Like we could be at like 10 deals under contract like how many would you say are from the radio ad versus the cold calling? So we don't, we always is a TV ad, but I think two are only from the t TV ad. Two are from a, a different marketing system that one of our acquisitions guy plugged us into. Two are word of mouth and then four are the uh, cold calls. Nice. Navigate. Yeah, it's good that you're diverse. And I mean, man, the first. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the first deal we got from your cold calling system, like we're closing it in a couple of weeks, but that thing's a seven figure spread build deal. Like I, I was like, I was so anti cold. I was like, man, I just have always been like going to an organic guy, like wholesalers send me deals or I'm, I'm an authority in my market. People know I'm serious and I'll close and that works. But in this market cycle that we've been in, like that just disappeared. Nobody was wholesaling. Like you were literally like wholesalers became wholesalers. They bought it and they put it on market and they made a huge spread. Like, so deals really dried up and it was like, we have to spend money on marketing. And I remember being so scared, like, dude, I don't want to go and drop a bunch of money on marketing. Like, what if it doesn't work out? And then we got that deal. I was like, we just paid for marketing for 10 years. We're all good. Yeah. Dude. Cause you right. literally cut me, you bought all the market. You cut me a $10,000 check for, for data. You cut yep. me another $3,400 for the calling. So yep. right there in the first, before we even get one lead in the door, you're 13, 14 grand in this deal. So yeah. it's scary. I mean, at the end of the day, it's scary. And you're like, okay, I trust Elliot. I, you know, you to make it right or whatever, we'll figure it out. We, we got yeah. good systems, but the, the key with the cold calling and why it works really well for some people like yourself and some people doesn't work well is you have systems and you follow up and you have a, a process and a plan in place and you're relentless and, and you work every lead really, really well. And if you don't yeah. do that, this does not work well. Yep. We've got, I get, I get so creative on the phone. I get juiced up about that. Like there was one lead. It was a new construction. The guy bought the house last year that a part of me wanted to hang up right away. I was like, there's nothing I can do for you. Like the house is too new. You're going to, I can't, yep. I can't buy off last year's value and make money this year. Yeah. So I stayed on the phone with him. Turns out he owns the entire thing free and clear. We may still get the deal. We may not. It doesn't matter the, 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 the point of the story is that you can be creative, right? But so he owned the entire thing. I was like, okay, so what? You sell your house. Let's say I could buy it for what you want. What are you going to do with the money? He's like, well, my savings account gets a really great interest rate. I'm like, well, okay, so how much are you going to make off putting $400,000 in the bank? He's like, I'm going to make about 500 bucks a month. It's going to be awesome. I'm like, oh, you're going to make 500 bucks a month. Okay. I was like, okay, so if I could pay you 1,200 bucks a month, does that change the game? Does that change? Does that change how we structure this deal? He's like, you would pay me twelve hundred bucks a month. I'm like, yeah. So we were gonna do some type of like contract for land or contract for deed or whatever, and I'm basically just gonna rent the house for a year, close on it in a year, pay him twelve hundred bucks a month, and in a year we, you know, we're banking on appreciation. If nothing else happens, we sell it for what we're in it for. Yeah, but and market we, but, market then, rents like sixteen hundred. Yeah. Airbnb arbitrage is like twenty two, twenty three. I could have cash flowed like five or six hundred bucks a month on it. Yeah. So. Nice. Nice. Just the idea of being creative. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah, like there's so many different opportunities. You can pit people into so many different buckets. It's just a volume game. All right. So let's talk a little bit about you guys got some development stuff that's actually pretty interesting. We talked a little bit yesterday with my guy that I'm I'm doing some development house build stuff with, and we were we're spitballing some ideas for you. But tell us about like how those kind of landed in your lap and how you're taking advantage of some leads that you know most people might have missed. Yeah. So I, I did some infill stuff back when I was in Portland. So I'm not like, I, I was never afraid of it. I, I get really excited when there's like a large land piece that comes across. And we're also just like, we're very plugged into the Treasure Valley community of like what's happening in our market. 
And there's some large national builders who have been very outright and saying like, we're coming to your market, we're taking over your market, and we will push out anybody who's not a national builder and can't compete with us. So all like the smaller builders are kind of panicking and they're like, well, I guess we're gonna not be able to buy those 50 unit subdivisions anymore. So we're gonna have to start like either JVing on those or we're gonna have to start buying like little infill projects like eight to 10 lots. So as soon as we heard that, we're in this meeting with like how they're trying to reposition and, and look at these smaller deals and they were letting us know numbers on this. We're like, dude, we just gotta like grab anything that fits that box. Cause we know that there's gonna be a huge demand for it now what because they're doing. Uh, it was a meeting. Uh, it was it was just here at uh, one of the local brokerages that Noah was, is a part of. And they had Level Up Capital came and had a bunch of local builders and their agents come and just kind of talk about market conditions and what was going on. Um, so we, they invited us to sit in on it. And I, I was just like, man, we got this. We just had this Lone Star project. We had like three or four that we were negotiating. So it was just good to kind of like hear what numbers because for us, we don't we're not really builders. So we don't know the numbers that they'll buy out. We don't know like what kind of percentages or cash on cash they are looking for in this type of stuff. So we're like, all right, how's this going to work? So being in that meeting, we really learned the numbers that we needed to be at to make it work for them. And so then we just got a little more aggressive when we were on the phone with those sellers that we knew had potential to have splits. And, um, but I guess in, in our mindset, in our mindset, we got a little more aggressive, but in the deals we ended up getting, we're like buying for like the flip. If, if we just flipped the house and didn't split the lot, like we're making 25, 30 grand. It's not a good flip, but we would never take it on, but we're doing that. And then still ending up with like anywhere from three to eight lots is what we're looking at right now. So our goal is to try and break even on the flip and then just have this parcel that's been split off and then is now going through its own little PUD process or minor land division. One of them we're annexing into the city. So we're trying to get into the raw dirt at $0 is our goal before land development which then just gives us a huge, a huge profit margin when we're going to look to sell these to developers or to builders. Yeah, that's a, that's an amazing. And it's funny because you'll look in sometimes maybe when you're newer and I was newer and you look and these guys be like, man, how can they pay this much money for this? And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, you see why, Yeah, because you know, they're doing what you just did. Right. And so you have a leg up and they're like, man, these, these flippers are, these guys are idiots. They just can't compete with them. They're overpaying for everything. Well, no, you just have to move upstream. You got to find, you know, if there's a book called who moved my cheese, you got to find who moved your cheese and you got, you can't just keep doing things the same way every day, yeah. day in and out. Right. Yeah. So, so why don't you talk a little bit about what, what, just so people know, kind of, why don't you talk a little bit about what the builders are, what you learned in that meeting, like break down some numbers on like what they're willing to pay, what kind of returns are they looking for? Um, you know, what yeah. kind of financing are they getting? Yeah, so ours is very specific to like the group of builders that we met with. Um, yeah, yeah. So Noah, you want to you want to run through the numbers? You want me to? Ah, uh, you you can. All right, cool. I don't, so I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember specific so details. I remember concepts. Essentially, down to like the the traditional goal was to buy the land at a fifth of what the if it's build ready like utilities there ready to go a fifth of what the back end value would be now they're willing to have those numbers be a little bit tighter so we're looking at like for example this project that we're looking at uh back in lots are anywhere from 550 or back in houses are 550 to 575 so it would give like a lot price traditional lot price of 110 to 120 and some change i was gonna do the calculator for you i, I think <laughs> I, I did the math the other day but I, because traditionally they want to be they wanted to be in the lots 18 to 23 percent is usually what i found out based on conditions yeah. that's where they kind of want to be yeah and that's about a fifth right i'm not great yeah, at math but yeah yeah so right about there is like traditionally where they wanted to be but now because of this market squeeze and this is probably just a local treasure valley thing but because of this market squeeze that's happening they know that they need to get lots and they need to get runway because the runway that they used to have isn't available anymore because you got uh menards and dr horton who are coming in and literally like paying for it like we just saw this article the other day that cbh one of the local builders he just like kind of put his foot down and he's like i'm not gonna lose he paid six times the uh, assessed value or the appraised value of the land to get that land and it's just raw raw acreage right now so like this is the type of stuff that's happening where like some of these other small builders they're not going to be getting these subdivisions anymore they have to go to this infill kind of this infill sector and so because of this the price that was getting floated around to us is okay if, if the normal value is about 125 you could squeeze 145 155 out of that if it's a real easy smooth type of build so that's where those are the numbers um, normally they're looking the number we were given and again we're this is not our area this is just what the people who are helping us dispo these are telling us that they're looking for about 100k spread on a build before like their costs so that includes their marketing costs like any payroll that they have going into it just outside of like actual build cost yeah. so that's the numbers that we've been getting and so we just kind of run our, our numbers backwards based on that yeah because what so what i found out when i was diving same same thing i'm mean, you're learning and learning as you're going is yeah 
So there's, there's two different, there's different types. There's developers, guys that yep. traditionally have just bought big pieces of dirt, this 50 lot subdivision, put the infrastructure in and sell the lots, right? Yep. Those yep. are the developers. Those developers, like the one I know in my town, he wants to make 30%. That's his goal is yep. to make 30% on the development. Then you have, you have your builders that want to make typically 20 to 30% as well, right? So say you're at 55, yep. 50%. What these national guys yep. are doing that or these regional guys like Hayden or, you know, Polish and these guys, right? They, mm -hmm. they'll come in and they'll skinning their margins and they'll say, okay, instead of 30%, I'll make 10% on the development. And instead of 25% on the build or 30% on the build, because we have so much more efficiencies than you, we'll cut that down to 15%. So they're literally yeah. going to be, because they're a developer builder, they literally can be at 25%, 20 to 25% net on yep. the whole project, right? They'll, they'll, yep. They got cheaper financing, they got bigger efficiencies because they can build houses faster, better, stronger, right? Yep. And so then, so you're saying, okay, they'll do it at 25%. I'm trying to do it total at 55%. You'll never win. You know, on a, yeah. on a, on a million or $2 million deal. I mean, that's a huge, the, even if you built the best report in the world with the seller, yeah. I mean, the best, you, they could be your mom and she's going to say, I'm selling to these guys. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, at the end the of the money. day, it's just kind of how yeah. it is. So, yeah. so you have to find these opportunities like you guys have found is like these houses yep. that have land attached to them, if you can get them and, and things like that. And to be competitive or go to the outskirts a little bit where they're not at yet. Right. You got to stay yeah. ahead of them. Yeah. And so the thing we're really trying to push with these guys is like kind of a pseudo partnership, I guess. So like we're taking down the deals, we'll do the flip um, and then they're going to put up the money for the land development as a down payment on the lot option to then buy the lots at that 150 price. So we have our buyer lined up. We also had their 100 grand, which 100 grand. Is that the right word? 100 grand. That was weird. Just sounded so weird. Candy bar. We got. Yeah, I was like, that was a candy bar, bro. So we got their 100K and we're using that for the land development costs. So it's it's reducing our skin in the game. I mean, there is they can pull out on that lot option and then you got to pay it back within 90 days or whatever. But they got that 100K in there that's covering your land development. They're then buying it and then they're taking over the build at that point. So once once land's ready to go, they'll do the build. We don't have anything involved in the build. We cashed out on the front end, but then we're lining ourselves up. Noah has his license and we have an in-house realtor under underneath him now so we're lining up full three percent commissions on the back end listings and then we're paying like a we're, our goal is to negotiate like a flat fee one to two k per house for our in-house agent and collect another 18 20 grand spread per house on just the commission side so noah when you listen to those first 80 episodes of the real deals i can hear tucker when you're talking right now jeff i can hear tucker in the back of my head you control your destiny by finding off-market deals right mm -hmm. These builders that were sitting in there scared out of their boots is they don't know how to find off-market deals. They don't know how to put deals together. They're so used to buying deals on the market that yeah. now all of a sudden you guys have them over a barrel because you control the deal. Yeah. Right. And so it's funny. I hear him in so many different podcasts, but I hear him in the back of my head, right? You know, you can hear this thing, you know, he's talking about getting financing on Iron Bridge or whatever. And he's like, you know, if you have a good deal, which if you're listening to the show, most of you probably do have a good deal, right? Because you've yeah. specialized in off market, right? Because he's been teaching you mm -hmm. off market deal structuring. And so it's, it's very interesting, but that's exactly what is needed right now. And it's the more competitive this environment has become, the better and more strategic you guys have got. And you've had to deploy more money to marketing. Yeah, your spreads, but when you're get them your spreads are way bigger yeah like you've just gone all in people are scared to spend that money on marketing yep. yeah yeah it's it's an interesting concept because it's like we talked about that earlier like i'm conservative on the flips and i'll i'll bring down our back-end values but on the marketing stuff i'm all in like it's i mean it's all proven concepts and especially yeah. like when we get to talk to you know you about stuff like this like i reached out i was like back in maybe february or january and i started talking about hey dude we need to get on like mailing and figuring out a sniper campaign for developable land yep. that we can then turn and do these type of things with builders. Yeah. You've got some really cool stuff that, that, that you do on that, on that end, um, that I'm excited to get into, but yeah, the problem, I think at that time I said, I had no time. <laughs> I'm so yeah, busy. Were, yeah, yeah, I was, was yeah. But you know, we had, we want to talk about like, how do you get on it? And, and we can talk more off offline, but you know, really, I, it's just how do you get very niche in what you're going after and then yeah. just send a really high quality mail 
right? At the end of the day, you know, yeah. Yeah. people that are watching this on YouTube or on Instagram, you know, we have really high quality mail that's, you know, handwritten, right? Handwritten mailers really yeah. stands out. Yeah. We have different, you know, here's another, here's another mailer that really stands out, right? You know, it's different. Everything's different. There's, yeah. you know, all, how do you, how do you stand out and spend more money on marketing? So between there's a sniper approach and there's a machine gun approach, right? Cold calling is machine yeah. gun, really targeted stuff is sniper. Yeah. Yep. We even like, we, we were kind of skeptical about the TV commercial and fortunately it kicked in, it, it kicked off a deal in like its first two weeks as well. So we're like, we're making like 60, 70 grand from that. And we're like, okay, that'll cover it. That literally covers the commercial costs and makes us 30 grand on the year. So we're going to keep it and run it for a year. Just until like last week, we hadn't really had any more leads come in from it. But what we have noticed is like when we send out our mailers, we're getting more calls because we put our pace, our faces on there and said, uh, as seen on TV or the guys from TV and we get calls and people are like, Oh, I've been meaning to call you. I saw the commercial. And then I got your postcard or we're on a, we're on the phone with some of these cold call leads. And we're like, Hey, this is Jeff with true city home buyers. And they're like, are you the guys from the commercial? And so like, it's funny, like the commercial hasn't kicked up a ton of leads, but it's added this credibility to the, now there's this extra layer where people recognize us and like automatically that feels familiar to them like they want to work with me more than they want to work with the other guy calling because they've seen me on tv they know i'm local to the treasure valley they There's, may have gotten a postcard yeah, we've built more trust yeah we get three sometimes some of these people we already have two touches before we even get on the phone with them like you know it takes yeah. three, three touches to have a chance at closing a deal i got two touches before i've even talked to them and now i get on the phone and that's the third touch already so i think that's worked out really well we've heard that time and time again and like it's opened up our our investor line like people see you on TV and like if somebody says, hey, you might know this because you're a marketing guy, but the traditional person, if you say, hey, I'm, I'm on a TV commercial, the only price that people associate with TV commercials is Super Bowl ads. Like That's yeah. the only thing that an uh, average American does. So they assume that this TV commercial is super expensive. And then they assume that if it's super expensive, you must be freaking killing it, which we're doing pretty good, but not enough to go and drop twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month on a commercial like somebody thinks we're spending. And so it just adds this credibility factor. And it's just been crazy to see what that does like in air every area of the business, like money lending, relationships, deal flow, all that type of stuff. So that's it's awesome. What did the T V commercial like to explain that? I've I've not I've heard some guys doing it. If you saw it, you would you would literally <laughs> pee yourself, me of a bro. Sam it's, wow commercial. it's so corny, but that's what's so brilliant it's, about it. It's nothing we special. It? Hey, this is Noah no, get out then, of here. This is Jeff with True City Home Bars. We're looking to buy homes in the Treasure Valley for cash now. We pay with cash. Fast. Call 208-900-CASH. Like, it's that's literally it. like, that's the voice. It's very cheesy, but like, we signed up for a program and this is the commercial. There's like three commercials that work. Like, the guy does a lot of testing behind it, deploys his commercial into multiple markets, different air time. So it's like, we're just going to trust you and copy and paste. It has worked out, but it is. If I have people who see it and they're like, bro, you are so cheesy. <laughs> That's funny. I was talking to a guy about doing radio ads a couple months ago. And one of the things I was in some mood that day and I'm like, what if we were to get a vanity number that was like 783 dead and was like, did grandma die? Call 783 dead. You know, do you need to get rid of grandma's house? Call 783 dead. <laughs> oh my goodness. Bro. I, I was like, we, we talked for like 20 minutes. I'm like all up on this commercial. I'm ready to go, ready to go. I tell Christy, she's like, fuck you. No. Like, That's the dumbest thing I've ever I'm heard. you launch that. Oh, I freaking love it. Dude, we had a guy on, this, on our show, like, it was our first episode we aired. And he was telling the story of how he got his first house. And I just remember, like, he did a really good job not being insensitive. But I was like, for people who don't know real estate, they might listen to this and be like, wow, these guys are jerks. Because he was like, yeah, this old lady died. It and was really so, cool. And he's like, oh, it's it not cool that she died. Yeah. That's not the part that's cool. <laughs> the deal was cool. Not the old lady dying was cool. And, but, yeah, that's yeah. funny, man. You would have definitely been well known for that commercial. Probably not in a good way, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't know, Tucker, I got the idea because Tucker ran one. Does your uh, I ran an ad for, wow, did your house smell like grandma or something like that? or? something uh yeah. and it was he said it worked but you also in portland you know you got a bunch of hate mail you know yeah. hate people angry or whatever so yeah luckily we're not in portland so anyway what would you guys say we're wrapping up here what you know and you guys are newer in the business jeff you've been doing it for long a little bit longer than i have but your partnership's green yeah what would you say the biggest challenge that you guys are facing right now is oh you want to go first i gotta go yeah you can go I mean, I, I actually think about this pretty often. I, I would say it's twofold. Recruiting good people and knowing whether or not I am judging those people successfully in the interview to put them in the right seat. Um, that's that's my first biggest issue right now. I mean, we're, we're doing a massive undertaking on bringing on people. Um, and then the second part I would say is uh, 
is being able to balance the the, the scaling of, of growing our business and also growing the private capital mm -hmm. that we infuse into the business. So, I mean, it's like every single time we're proud of ourselves, we're like, holy crap, <laughs> we just did a really good job. Then all of a sudden we have more projects than we have money again. And we're like, I guess we need to go raise more money. So never like, ending. It's never, yeah. it's a never ending. Like two weeks ago, we were like, we have so much private money. And now we have like 10 deals up on our potential board. And we're like, we don't have any private money. Yeah. <laughs> And then it's it's weird too because it's like you f I, I feel like I like build myself I, I build I build both of us up to where like we're out we're outsourcing you know our roles and stuff like that and then all of a sudden it feels like we get pulled back in yeah and then we're working in the business instead of on it and so yeah. you know I think that and I guess that summarizes my the the three biggest challenges yeah. for me right now and I echo that second one I definitely feel like we get dragged back into uh, performing in our roles rather than like overseeing our roles and I, that's just like a growing pain of scaling right but then like for me the biggest hurdle and it's like we were very good at our roles but now that's no longer important like if I want to be good at operations forever like that's fine like maybe we'll do two million dollars in revenue every year but I'm going to be working every single day on this business so now it's like I got to become a very good leader of people which is so much different than what I was doing before. Like before I was just being like a high level employee and I just happened to work for myself. Like I was good at my job, but now I need to be good at making sure other people are good at their job and leading and casting vision and showing them like what our purpose is and what's our why and like getting people motivated and then also holding them accountable without being a dick. Like if I'm blunt, that's like that's the hardest part. Like yeah, I'm either right. like, I'm either a pushover or an asshole. There's no in between Jeff. Like I either like let you run over me or I just respond in like anger and resentment. And like as a good leader, you can't do that. So like, that's like just on a personal level, like that's the biggest thing for me is like learning to navigate that and do that much more successfully. If I was going to pay one person and I have, but if I was going to pay one person in this world that I've met, and I've met a lot of different people in the real estate space, right? Business space. Yeah to learn how to be a leader, to teach me how to grow and hire people and be a leader, it'd be Tucker Maryhew. Really? Honestly, I would, I, I, I talk about it all often and, you know, watching him over the last year in this call center, handle situations, handle my emotional swings, handle Cole being, you know, 22, mm. 23, just normal stuff. That's, you know, nothing yeah. good or bad in a sense. It's just being a guy that has experience, but knows how to be a leader. I literally would go to battle for that guy any day of the week. I just don't want to let him down. And he, he's an equal partner. He's not my boss, but he's kind of the boss. We've made him the boss because yeah. that's who his role is. Right. Yeah. And I never have to question how much he's working. I don't care all these things. I, I literally tell people all the time. I would literally wipe shit off his shoes to learn from this guy. Wow. Kind of the same way you said you were crumpling paper with for that guy earlier. You just want to learn. Yeah. You're doing something right. Yep. You know, so finding guys and mentors like that, that are, you know, th five, 10 years ahead of you that have done multiple businesses that maybe have failed, yeah. you know, Tucker's yeah. had a few failed, you know, things and find that guy. Also my partner, Corey, um, he's taught me how to be, um, a leader, but more, uh, he's taught me a lot on how to be a good husband, a good father, a good friend yeah. and how to be, um, you know, not take things too seriously. And, um, how to shut up when I need to s shut up and, you know, just teach me like been a dad. So, yeah. um, yeah. what are some of those things that you see in, in Tucker that, um, that make him such a great leader? He's very even keel. So he's not too many highs and not too many lows. Like when we have someone really good happen, like you can tell he's happy and excited, but it's like, not like me where I'm emotional roller coaster. And when someone challenges, he just, you don't feel like he's mad at you. But you feel like if you just you disappointed him, mm. kind of like that father figure, right? When Cole and I have similar opinions on whatever direction we want to go, he doesn't even make an opinion. He just says, okay, if that's what you guys want to do, let's go with that. You know, I trust you guys. He gives us trust to go do what we want to do. Um, yeah. he lets he gives us rope to, you know, go hang ourselves or screw something up. Yeah. When Cole and I are fighting about something in a in a competitive way where he thinks it should be one way and I think it should be another way, Tucker will just make a decision and we just both respect him in the sense of that's the decision. And once he makes the decision, it's done. He's fair to people. He's methodical. He's well thought out. He's quick. He's not quick to make decisions. So he'll think things through really well. And he just, uh, he's a good person. I think, I think, yeah. you know, I think if I called him and I said, I have a fire, I need your help right now. He'd, he'd be there for me. So you just trust him. You just, you just yeah. trust him. That's good, man. Yeah. That's really cool. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. So anybody out there, I mean, I know he does some little coaching for real estate stuff, but I mean, the best money I've ever spent was giving it to Tucker, being part of the DFA, getting around that networking group of guys. I have paid Tucker a couple of times throughout the years. Chris and I just to do like a three part coaching for going over our business. 
he always gave yeah. way more value than we paid him, you know, probably. But yeah, we have a we have a lot and uh, continues every day to owe him a lot. Yeah, for sure. That's rad. It's it's been actually really cool just to see the progression of like, you know, now you run this show. Yeah, yeah that's you know what I mean. Rad. And like he like uh, what was the relationship of you and Tucker like when I met you like in 2016? Uh, it was very just, I'm in his DFA group. He'll talk to me. He would call me back every now and then if I called him, but I didn't really bug him. There was not a much, you know, interaction other than like on the DFA. Um, unless I needed something, he was always really quick to respond there, especially in the DFA group. He responds within an hour, usually on things. If you have questions. Right. Um, so it was just, you know, kind of a coach, but from afar, you know, more hands off mm -hmm. approach yeah. because we weren't paying full for coaching. It was, you know, 200 bucks a month for the DFA. Yeah. But then, uh, yeah, so then we started doing the call or this uh, call center together. And he happened to be gone for one week doing Steve, uh, uh, Steve uh, out of Tran. Steve Tran show. And I'm like, hey, yeah. how about Cole and I hop on the show? And we did it. And he's like, hey, you guys did such a good job. Why don't you guys take it over? And then I kind of ended up <laughs> being here because Cole was busy with some other stuff. And yeah, I'm just hope he doesn't take it away. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. <laughs> he's like, I'll take it back now. I'm, I'm ready. Yeah, he's like, you got, you let those two kids on the show, you're done. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, he's like, all right, Elliot, your privileges are revoked. <laughs> yeah, your privileges are too revoked. much freedom. That's but good. even with the show, you know, he ran the show for eight years, and he has not once told me this is what you need to do. This is who you need to have on. This is the direction you need to go. It's been yeah. a coach and a guy, and I say, hey, I'm, you know, I don't want to do this. He won't even let me look at the numbers because he doesn't want me to go by the numbers. He just trusts me to make the decisions. And when I need help, he's there to help me. Yeah. And it's, right. it's just really cool because he empower. I think the best way he empowers people to want to be better. And I think mm. that's what a true leader is, right? Is they yeah, empower you to want to be better. Yep. You know, what's funny, man, is I see a lot of that in you not to be corny or weird. Right. But like, seriously, like I call you with an issue. Yeah. You pick up the phone, you walk me through it and you hold me accountable. Yep. Like it, it, it's, it's just kind of cool to see that progression. Like now you're re freaking running his show and like you pointed me to him when I started and you're like, dude, you need to go listen to this guy. So I did. And now it's just, it's just so weird. Like look at it all being brought full circle. Yep. Yeah, dude. I, I, yeah. Life's funny for sure. So Been anyway, guys, man. I know you guys got an appointment at two. You got to get to. So thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, it was really enjoyable. I think you guys both are just quality, quality men. Um, and I'm really excited to build our relationship more. I'm excited for you guys to come up and meet your two kids, Jeff, and yeah. um, play with Monty. So, yeah, for sure, man. Looking forward to it. I'll bring appreciate the dogs. You. I'll bring the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, dude, thank you, man. We really appreciate you having us on, and we uh, we appreciate everything you do for us and our business too. Absolutely, cool, man. guys. All right, peace, brother.